This is Twit. So uh, I just have to ask, just so we have a baseline for comparison, can you tell us about the Carrington event? Because that sounds like that was a pretty exciting couple of days. It was 1859, I think? Yes, 1859. So it was the very end of August, 1st of September. Um, the gentleman named Richard Carrington is a British astronomer, was observing the sun with a telescope. He did have somewhat protective uh, eyewear. He didn't have the same kind of protection we have today, but he was looking at the sun in visible light and he saw the sunspot get blurry all of a sudden. And what that meant was there was a, there was a flare. There was an intense increase in light. One of the things we know today is that when you see large changes in the visible light, which is what he saw, that's actually indicative of a very large event because it doesn't happen very often. But what we also saw is not too long after that, uh, he and other scientists around the world noticed all kinds of things happening. Aurora, they noticed changes in the Earth's magnetic field, um, some of the, the magnetometers that measure that were off the scale. Also, the, we didn't have the power grid system, but we had the telegraph system. And telegraphs were running without being connected to their power source. They were running off of the electricity created by the solar storms. And what we know today is that this was a perfect storm. There was a huge eruption of material, a big blob of solar stuff, we call it a coronal mass ejection, that cleared the way in the solar system. And then another big one came after that. And that impacted the Earth, creating a, an incredibly powerful geomagnetic storm, a massive disturbance in the Earth's magnetic field. It sort of rung it like a big bell. That created aurora that was so powerful, it was seen very far south, uh, actually much like the event we saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, but there are uh, stories that it was so bright in the middle of the night that people woke up thinking wow. it was it was dawn. Mm -hmm. um, there were some uh, telegraph operators who were electrocuted. I Ooh. don't believe any of them died, but um, there was a fire created because they had paper tape that um, that was used in the telegraph office and the paper tape caught on fire and burned down some of the uh, the telegraph offices. So it was just a, a really huge storm. We don't know exactly how big it was because of course we didn't have spacecraft measuring, but we can do a lot of things using paleo information, you know, data from ice cores and things of that nature. And even looking at how far south the aurora was and how strong the magnetic field was changing. And we do believe that it is the strongest storm for at least several centuries. Mm -hmm. um, it may have, uh, it certainly had a very large coronal mass ejections. It had a very large solar flare, which is this big blast of just light. Um, and both the solar flare and the coronal mass ejection create these massive shock waves, you know, like a like a sonic boom. They're sort of like a snowplow going through the solar system, and they accelerate particles, uh, ions, electrons, protons. They accelerate them to near the speed of light, creating this shower of high energy radiation, um, which is exactly what we we are concerned about. For example, with astronauts. Mm. Um, and so it's considered kind of the standard candle for, you know, a superstorm. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to ask a little bit about the different things to look for in, in these, these events. Well, first of all, you, you mentioned that the, the solar cycle is 11 years long and they're, they have names, right? We are in solar cycle. It's 25. 25 correct. Yes. Yeah. So, and is that, so what is that? 25 times 11. I don't know the math. Rod, do you know it? What? Huh? <laughs> what? That's so that's that's over uh, uh, like a, a, a couple hundred years. Then that we've been. Yeah, we've it? been. Yeah. We've actually been counting sunspots uh, for several for about four hundred years. Uh, we have data farther back than solar cycle number one, but as soon as we felt the data was uh, robust enough, then we started actually numbering these cycles. You know, and one, two, and so on. 
And, and do you know why it's 11 years? I mean, the seasons on Earth are a year long, right? We, they change. Well, <laughs> it's that's actually a really big question that we don't know the answer to. We know that there is a, well, we believe based on uh, understa- our understanding of, for example, the Earth's magnetic field, um, as well as other stars, that there's a process called a dynamo. So when you have uh, a conducting fluid or a plasma, the sun is actually a plasma, which is when you, um, you, you heat up a gas so much that the atoms break apart in, into electrons and then the nucleus of the atom. So that gives them the electrical property. So if you have a conductor and it's liquid or a plasma, when it's rotating, it has what's called differential rotation and is actually something you see on Jupiter and Saturn. Mm. The equator rotates faster than as you move towards the poles, it rotates slower. And there's magnetic fields inside the star, inside the sun, and also inside the, the liquid core of the Earth. And because these are conductors moving, they drag the magnetic field. And so they're dragging it uh, much more and faster near the equator than they are at the poles. And so when the solar cycle is at the minimum, the magnetic field is very relatively uniform going from north to south. And then over the 11 years, it starts twisting it up. And that eventually causes the magnetic fields to pop out the surface. They float to the surface and gives us sunspots. Mm -hmm. But why is it 11 years? (laughs) We don't know. We really don't know. We have computer models. We have some physics that, that allows us to recreate a dynamo, but we can't make it even given the, you know, the various properties we know of the sun, we can't actually make it exactly 11 years or, huh. and in fact, it's actually sometimes a little bit longer, like 11 and a half and sometimes a little bit shorter. So that's, you know, <laughs> of the many ones, that's like one of the $64,000 questions. Do you ever like just go outside and, and shout at the sun? <laughs> why? 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 Why eleven years? <laughs> why? Well, I do right go there, out. You. <laughs> Tarek, you know, you're you're projecting again. <laughs> you know, one of the things thinking, saying about you know, speaking of going out and looking at the sun. Obviously, we've always been told we shouldn't look at it, uh, and we do know what happens if you do. Now, uh, <laughs> talking about it earlier, but. If you use your your eclipse glasses, or we call those sol, you know safe solar viewing glasses, you can wear those. Go outside, you know, when the sun is out and it's nice and clear, and you can look at the sun. And during high activity, like around now, you will see sunspots. Mm-hmm. They get so big, many times the size of Earth, that we can see them with our own eyes from wow. from our from the Earth's surface. Well, which I well, find I, just amazing that you can do that. And and I, I, I do I do encourage anyone, if you've got glasses, to go ahead and try and do that. It is really fun to see uh, that kind of stuff. And I did want to ask, then, you know, so we talk about sunspots, and those are created by the magnetic field poking up. And those are cooler spots on the surface of the sun. That's why they're dark, but they're still super hot. Is that yes, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then you talked about flares and coronal mass ejections. And, and then radiation. And those seem like three different kinds of storms mm-hmm. from the sun. I mean, is that the, the, the what are yeah. the different types of weather that we see from the sun? Then? Absolutely. There are different types of weather. I mean, you could maybe think of, you know, just like we have uh, different scales of weather. We have thunderstorms, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes. Um, so they're all related. And for example, a lot of times you can have smaller flares um, that don't have a coronal mass ejection associated with it. Um, You can have coronal mass ejections that come from eruptions of what's called a prominence or filament. They're the same thing. If you look at a prominence is when you look at this structure, it's usually pinkish red on the edge of the sun. If you look at it over the disk of the sun, it's, it's called a filament. Uh, we used to not know that they were the same thing, but now we do know that. Those can erupt on their own, and they 
don't necessarily create a flare, but they can, you know, give it give you a CME. Uh, both flares and CMEs separately can cause the particle storm. So they're all related to each other. They're all a form of the release of magnetic energy. So that, you know, in that sense, they all kind of come from a very similar origin. Um, what we do find is when the flares are larger, as they get larger, that correlation between flares and CMEs becomes stronger and stronger. That is, if there's a big flare, there's a good chance, not always, but there's a really good chance there's going to be a big CME. And that both of those mean there's po a possibly good chance that we might see, you know, one of these particle storms. So you mentioned some of the the risks associated with this, and I'm I'm interested in talking more about the power grid and so forth. But uh, one of the things I remember during the Apollo program was, you know, they didn't know nearly as much about the sun as you do now, but they tried very hard to make sure that these guys didn't launch during a time when there was likely to be some kind of uh, big radiation spike from the sun. And I've always been a little, I, I think you sort of touched on it, but I've always been a little confused about uh, the transit times of coronal mass ejections mm -hmm. versus flares. So one's effectively light radiation EM and the other one is a particle event and it takes like nine minutes or so. Uh, yeah. So we actually have three different time scales here. So uh, we do have the flare, as you mentioned, which is light and we, we, that takes eight minutes. Eight minutes. Um, the, the coronal mass ejection takes is much slower it's going at a measly couple million miles an hour uh, which <laughs> sounds really fast but compared to light it's eight. not yeah. yeah and so that's going to take anywhere from 17 16 17 hours up to several days and there is a relationship mm. between the faster more powerful cmes or the ones that get here early for example we mentioned the carrington event the estimates are that that cme got here in about 17 hours so, mm -hmm. so that's a fast one. Um, and then the particles are in between. They, they can be very close to, they can be very relativistic, meaning they're close to the speed of light, or they can also be, you know, slower ones. The, the ones that are closer to the speed of light typically take something like 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes um, to get here. But those particle storms can also last for a long time. We've actually had one a couple days ago that lasted for a long time. And you can see the effects of that at the at the poles of the Earth on communications. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>